Hey guys, welcome back to Young Americans Abroad, your best place for weekly content on young American soccer players playing overseas. My name is Austin Van Churn. My name is Patrick Ferry. And welcome to our show. So guys, after last week's, you know, big weekend for some of our players. Three, two, one. So guys, after a great last weekend, uh, Pat, not so, you know, so great this weekend from some of our players. And uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely a brutal weekend. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, um, not the performances that you know we were expecting. Um, you know, some other some good news here and there mixed in, but yeah, o- overall, um, you know, I, I know it's a, a tough time, kind of not even really having a preseason kind of full swing uh, into things here. But uh, you know, we we you know we do expect great things from our, our Yaz. Very true. You know, all of our players are still young. They're you're young Americans abroad, so you know they're. There is some challenges uh, that come along the way of development, I guess, so to speak. So, you know, this week we want to talk through, you know, again, some of these week two slumps from our players. And an American uh, fullback reportedly choosing Barcelona over Bayern. And finishing it off, we have one player who actually had a really good game um, and picked up an assist for his team. So all that and more in today's episode. So the first player we want to talk about today is Gio Reyna. And uh, Pat, Gio uh, started and played all 90 minutes in Dortmund's 2-0 loss. So unfortunately, Dortmund went down to Augsburg. um, And to be fair, Pat, Augsburg played a pretty good game um, and really capitalized on some uh, transition play that was uh, really good. But, you know, in this game, Gio was uh, definitely, you know, not up to his his usual self. Um, At times, he was a little loose in possession and, and some of his passes really didn't come off. Um, so it was a little unfortunate to see that. I think Dortmund on a whole um, in this game were really, they started off well, I thought. I, I thought they had some some good play and looked pretty confident. But as the game went on, they, they kind of lost some confidence. And uh, yeah, weren't able to really, really squeak out the result, Pat. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's definitely unfortunate, Austin. And um, yeah, it seems like, uh, again, obviously Gio wasn't, you know, on, on his sharpest or, or best moments there, but it seems like just as a team, they uh, you know, had a little bit of, I guess, underwhelming performances as, as a collective group. And, um, you know, not to, I guess, foreshadow in, into our conversations here, but it seems like a lot of, uh, you know, other top teams as well were, were a little bit off their game. And I'm not sure if it's uh, just in general a problem of not really having the typical preparations that you do, um, you know, to start seasons. Yeah, I'm not really sure what it was, to be completely honest. Um, you know, they played pretty well last week, and I thought, you know, Gladbach's definitely a better opponent than, than Augsburg. So I thought they were right. going to, you know, they had their feet under them because um, they did have kind of a shaky preseason. They had some good performances, and then they had some um, losses to, like, Feyenoord and I think a few other teams too. So, yeah, um, yeah it was definitely interesting um, with that slant from their preseason. But – like I said, last week they were fine. They started this game pretty well, but but Augsburg just capitalized and um, really put them in a tough situation. And I think, um, you know, what was what was really interesting when, when watching Gio in this game was you really saw kind of um, him getting bodied um, on and off the ball at times. He took you don't see that often. Balls. Yeah, and I mean, he's, he's a young player, so he's still, you know, growing into his body and, and getting um, – I guess, maturing more and, and getting bigger. But uh, yeah, it was definitely something that he hasn't really had to deal with too far or, or too much yet in his career. And, uh, you know, it, it's just part of that learning experience, growing, growing, um, you know, development. So, yeah, I, I think when, when you looked at this game um, in the 55th minute, he got taken down in the, in the box. And I thought it was a pretty decent shout for a penalty. It ended up not, uh, being a penalty, but um, it was definitely kind of a, a tipping point in the game, which, you know, if Dortmund were able to, to get that penalty and score, it would have changed things. Um, and then, yeah, I thought, you know, it also was interesting in this game, Pat, with with Gio was, you know, Dortmund 
uh, looked to make subs pretty early in the second half and uh, brought on Julian Brandt and Marco Royce, who are the two players, again, that that kind of Gio and Jude Bellingham are on the field instead of. Um, those are the two youngest players that that kind of fill both of their positions in these past two starting lineups. And it was interesting because Gio was not one of the subs. So Jude Bellingham came out, and I'm blanking on who else came out with him, but but – at the end of the day, Geo stayed on the pitch for the entire game. Um, you know, when Dortmund were pressing to try and try and score goals, so I thought that was really interesting because I personally felt that when those two were kind of going to come on, it was going to be Jude coming off with Geo and uh, Dortmund kind of moving to a more experienced lineup to to get the the goals back and and you right. know and level it with Augsburg. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I would have thought um, too. Just in terms of I know um, positionally the competition. Um, kind of recovering there from from injuries, and getting full fitness, but um, you know, experienced player, you know, like like Roy specifically, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, it right. definitely shows that um, you know the coach there and and the staff, you know, really do trust Geo uh, moving forward. It seems just like a like we've been talking about, just a crucial part to Dortmund's team, and um, it, it's interesting, almost, and I don't want to switch it too much the the conversation the direct direction, but it almost seems like. Uh, you know, sometimes as you're you're playing with a you know a really strong team as Dortmund is, and um, obviously your opponent previously is a little bit stronger, but sometimes you kind of I don't even want to say play down uh, to some of those lower teams. Right. You kind of see that trend with a lot of bigger clubs, and um, you know I think that that was unfortunately the case with Dortmund. And um, again, maybe maybe Geo. It is interesting to see him, like you said, kind of get bodied off a little, roughed up a little bit, and maybe not as sharp as usual. But um, I know that can sometimes be kind of a psychological or mental thing kind of going on with games when you're, you know, up against Bayern. Uh, maybe if it was Bayern this week as opposed to Augsburg, it would have been a different performance. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting perspective. And I think, yeah, that definitely definitely plays a role. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you brought up Bayern, which is a perfect segue. So Bayern on Sunday uh, actually lost 4-1 to Hoffenheim. So when you really put this weekend in perspective, you know, Dortmund losing – uh, on the same weekend Byron loses, it's not, I guess, as big of a deal. Um, but still, you know, uh, Dortmund are really going to have to push themselves this season if they want to beat Byron, who, in my opinion, Pat, are kind of at the best level they've ever been at. So, uh, you know, this this loss definitely didn't help them, but that Byron loss helped them. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. So I think, you know, going into next week, I think it'll be interesting to see if Geo starts again. Um I, I really don't know. I think it was good to see him stay on the pitch the entire game um, because I think Lucian Favre, kind of like you alluded to, Pat, really rates him and thinks he's a difference maker. So I think we'll really kind of understand how highly Lucian Favre uh, rates him uh, when we see, you know, the starting lineup next week and if he's in it um, because I think that will tell, you know, us that that he's one of the best 11 players that, that Lucian can really put out at the moment, um, which is interesting because – you know, if if Geo's in that starting lineup and and you know Julian Brand or Marco Royce isn't, then um, that really is kind of kind of interesting. And uh, uh, I don't know how accurate it is, but I, I you know I think that's um, going to bode well, I guess, for the the rest of the season. Um, but yeah, that was basically uh, it for Geo. Pat, do you have anything else to, to finish up with on him? Yeah, just quickly add. I think you know, you're a great great analysis there, Austin. And uh, yeah, just wanted to. Just finish up on, on, you know, interesting points just uh, in terms of, you know, the youth movement, obviously, we've seen, but especially trusting Gio and, um, you know, some of these other, uh, you know, Jude and uh, the other youngsters there that they have. It will be a really tough task. Um, like you said, Byron's at the top of their game. Um, they do have some young players, but just experienced, you know, still with Lewandowski and, and Miller and, and uh, you know, obviously, youngster Davies doing well. Um, but, yeah, Byron's right. at an elite level where, um, you know, again, this is young Americans abroad, and I firmly believe in the future. But against a you know a very experienced Bayern side, um, you know, it'll be interesting to kind of see how a, a youthful Dortmund side can kind of persevere, especially over the duration of the season. Yeah, that's that's so true. Yeah, um, yeah, especially after winning the the treble and then winning the Super Cup. Uh, yeah, Bayern's Bayern's thriving right now. So. Yeah. Yeah, I guess with that, we'll move over to a player that moved to a big club this summer. 
Um, but unfortunately, it continues with this, uh, this week two slump we alluded to in the beginning. That's right, Austin. And we're talking about uh, Weston McKinney, um, you know, with, uh, you know, Juventus. I know I was, uh, <laughs> I apologize for, you know, I didn't even realize I was uh, mispronouncing it. So uh, again, I earned a second start, which is, you know, great, Austin, you know, fantastic. It's still a historic moment. And, um, you know, he did unfortunately um, come out after 58 minutes um, in a 2-2 draw against Roma. So um, just, uh, you know, an underwhelming game for, the, for uh, you know, the team as a whole, um, you know, under under Pirlo. And obviously you had some, some great reviews and, and highs from the first game, but, um, you know, that can instantly come back uh, crashing down <laughs> after just one performance especially the top clubs. So, you know, they went down to 10 men. Um, I think Adria Rabio got that second yellow. Um, uh, and they were able to, you know, Ronaldo really saved them in the game. But really want to focus on McKenney's performances where, you know, just, uh, you know, we were able to both uh, check out the game there. And I think we both have some, some great insights yeah. and perspectives. And uh, I think we can kind of agree that it, you know, definitely was an underwhelming performance. Um, again, I don't want to be too harsh, but... Um, you know, this is certainly a step up from the the first uh, you know week one opponent where Roma had uh, you know you know your players for obviously uh, Jacko and and uh, specifically where McKenny was matched up against uh, Veratu if I'm pronouncing that right the French uh, you know midfielder there who you know had a really big game and put McKenny on, on his heels and, and really pressed high and you could see Roma um, you know really just kind of taking the game from the beginning to uh, um, Juventus there and. Yeah, just it, they looked out of sync. Uh, McKenney was, I know, in the sixth or seventh minute there, Austin. He, I think, collected possession there, was kind of turning, and, and it was a little bit slow to move the ball on and, and lost it there. And almost, um, you know, fortunately, they were able to recover it, but almost gave away a huge, uh, you know, counterattack there and, and breakaway. And that seemed to kind of ruffle his feathers uh, moving forward, where I would maybe even say McKenney played maybe – just a, few, a handful of, you know, forward passes, a lot going backwards um, to the side, but, um, you know, not even really kind of getting in, in the groove and in, in the flow um, of the offense. So I know it kind of was talking there a little rambling for a lot, but I want to get your take on it, Austin. Yeah. And I definitely want to clarify, you know, uh, before I start, before I start my, my ranting, Pat, <laughs> you know, this is his second game for, a a big club, you know, this is Ronaldo's team. Um, So you got to think of them, I guess, in a, in a breath of a Real Madrid, a Barcelona, you know, this is a team that's won nine straight uh, Italian league titles. So it's going to take some time and, and it's definitely a step up from the situation he was at in at Schalke. Um, But with that being said, yeah, this was definitely not a great game from him. Um, And kind of like you said, Pat, you know, that first, uh, I guess, what would you call it? I guess that first instance of him being on the ball um, and, and almost losing it and, and creating a, a, you know, Roma goal, so to speak, uh, definitely, in, in my opinion, rattled him. And uh, yeah, it just was, it looked like he um, was nervous to kind of get in the game. Um, There's definitely some moments where, you know, there's multiple players around him and he kind of let the other players get the ball, which, you know, it is what it is. That's not, a huge thing. Um, but at the same time, it just, it just shows he was kind of timid, I think. And, um, yeah, it just defensively, I, I think, you know, that's what he's going to be asked to do this season is really be the guy who, who puts in a tackle, the guy who always, um, you know, gets to 50, 50 balls, um, really reads the game defensively and can kind of step in and, and get interceptions. And I thought in this game, right from the start, he, he was a little slow and just, was not reading the game, Um, you know, to be fair, like he normally reads the game. We normally see him get, you know, multiple tackles a game and, and steps in and wins some, um, you know, intercepts the ball and, and, and wins the ball that way. But in this game, you really saw him kind of picking the wrong side um, when he went in on, on challenges and, um, you know, pressing players. It looked like, uh, who was it? I think Pedro in the early part. First half, um, kind of just duped him, you know, went right by him with a with a skill move, and it just seemed like that continued throughout his time on the pitch. So, I, I do think, you know, uh, with that being said, you have to give a lot of credit to Roma. I thought Roma, and to be fair, I don't watch them all the time. You know, Serie A, Pat, we we really haven't taken much stock in in Serie A since uh, you know last week. Uh, but but with that being said, you know, Roma definitely 
looked up for the game. They came out. Um, they really controlled the tempo of the game and and took it to Ju- Juventus. Uh, so, you, you know, with that being said, I think um, that put Juventus in a position where, uh, you know, their players were going to be prone to mistakes and um, rushing p- uh, passes, plays, uh, you know, not really thinking um, on their feet, kind of being more timid um, in their thought process. And, and I think that, you know, that kind of got to, to Weston as well. So yeah, all, all that being said, you know, uh, he did come off for, for who was Arthur, right. Yeah. Arthur on for him. And then Rabio got the the red card. So uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think Juventus once uh, Arthur and Rabio or excuse me, Arthur and Benson core came on, um, even a man down, they just looked a little bit more poised. Uh, I thought Arthur looked great. You know, Pirlo has been talking about how he wants his his midfielders to press and really be active and kind of flying all around the pitch. And that was really what Arthur provided. So, um, you know, looking ahead to the next game, I almost think you'll see kind of that switch now to Arthur and Benton core for at least, you know, the next game. And then, you know, we'll see what happens. And, and, I, I think Weston will definitely get uh, more playing time. This isn't, you know, it was a bad performance, but but Juventus really only have five midfielders for for a whole season's worth of games with a congested schedule. So um, he'll definitely get his his other opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better, Austin. Um, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Again, and and like you said, all credit to Roma, and and even uh, you know McKenney's performance was a little underwhelming, but um, you could even say the first half was. You know, a handful yeah. of the entire, um, uh, you know, Juventus midfield with uh, Kulsevski, if I'm pronouncing it right, Kulsevski. Kulsevski, uh, yeah, Kulsevski. Yep. 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 And then, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, even uh, you know, Ramsey. Had a Murata few- wasn't great. Murata, Murata and Murata yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, the connections just weren't there, and even Pirlo addressed that. And I know, obviously, he's uh, interesting. Um, you know, being that that coach that. You know, coming from, I think, believe he was really with the, the U23s coaching there before. For nine days. <laughs> yeah, this huge jump. So, yeah. uh, you know, this was certainly a, a huge test, and it, it's so, still so early. So um, you're going to see people freak out on Twitter. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, Weston's got to kind of ignore that noise there, which I'm sure he, he certainly does. And, uh, again, there's going to be a lot of tinkering, like you said, and, and with those limited midfielders and, um, you know, a lot of games coming forward where, um, you know, they're, they're trying to almost, you know, change the, the culture and the style of the brand where they're like, we mentioned right. before, they're at that certain point where they want to push, you know, these are Ronaldo's last few, you know, solid high caliber years where, you know, he wants to win champions league or, or be in that final. So, um, you know, he'll certainly do some tinkering there. And uh, I think it's just, a, again, a new league, a new style system players. He's got to learn to play with, um, you know, even Rabio, you know, had some great bright moments, but also, looked out of sync too and it was kind of slow and uh reading and slow on tackles so um you know i, I would say almost the, the full blame was just uh the entire midfield especially in the first half like you mentioned when those changes occurred um you know even when weston um gathered the ball there you know the the runs weren't timing right with with Murata. i know there's a few offsides with other players and um they just i think they need a, a few more games to gel together but obviously being such a a huge club and with Inter and other teams, you know, knocking on the yeah. door. This, year, this is going to be a huge test. Yeah, for sure. And Inter came back and actually beat Fiorentina who, who went up on them this weekend. So yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it, it's, it's Roma too. It was away at Roma. Obviously there's less fans in the stadium. I think they only had a thousand, I think. <laughs> a thousand. Yeah. So yeah, it's all, it's all that. And I just hope that, you know, coming away from this game, Weston, can put it in perspective. And I, I think he will, you know, we've seen this from him before. We've seen him have bad games at Chalco. We've seen him have bad games for the USMNT and um, you know, he still comes back and, 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 you know, puts plays his best and puts, you know, his best on the field. So that's, that's my hope for him. You know, I hope next week we'll, we'll see him again on the pitch, whether that's as a starter or a sub and um, you know, see him come back stronger and more uh, even more determined. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think uh, unless unless you have any additional details, I think uh, you know. Again, like you said, we just got to keep moving forward, and, and Weston will get his times to opportunities to you know impress uh, and continue to impress because um, you know even one bad game, and um, you know you, you really have to 
you know, work quickly in training in, in the next game and move on and improve because, um, you know, it's not at all like a, not even to bring this comparison, but a Miazga where he went in and was taken off at half instantly. Yeah. Um, that yeah. can do a lot to damage a player's mindset, especially a, a player coming in. So I almost did want to mention too, I, I did kind of like where, you know, Pirlo didn't immediately take him off. Maybe, uh, you know, some people would be, you know, obviously, you know, wanting that change immediately at half, but I can do a lot <laughs> yeah. of damage, uh, you know, mentally. So I think that was a you know good move to at least give him you know additional ten minutes or so. Yeah, that's actually a good point too. Because um, yeah, I was texting you and I was like, oh boy, oh boy, I don't yeah. Know. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's true. So uh, yeah, moving on to another midfielder, uh, we're going to go back to the Bundesliga and talk about Tyler Adams. So Tyler, again, started for Leipzig and played all 90 minutes in their 1-1 draw with Leverkusen. And Pat, this was a really different game for Leverkusen, or excuse me, for Leipzig um, against Leverkusen than it was for them, you know, in that first week of the Bundesliga against, uh, I believe it was Köln, where they kind of ran the show, controlled yep. position, and Tyler, um, you know, was really key in kind of setting up their their passing um from the back. And, and so this game, they, they were actually, uh, they actually had less possession than Leverkusen. Leverkusen had 60% of the ball and uh, that really forced Leipzig to do a lot of the defending on the day. And Tyler, you know, was really tasked with playing a more defensive role for this game. Um, You know, even more than he, than he normally does in his defensive midfielder role. Um, So looking at his game, you know, unfortunately this was one of the games I actually couldn't watch live. So um, I just was able to catch a few highlights and, um, you know, I wanted to look at his stats too and kind of see where he fell in the day. So, so looking at his stats, he had 71% passing on the day, which isn't, isn't the best. Um, but here is a really telling stat for me. He only had 40 touches on the ball. Um, so that was down from 92, you know, against Cole. And I think, you know, looking at those two numbers uh, again, against Cole, he was kind of that, that quarterback, like Julian Nagelsmann said, um, but in this game, he had, you know, more than, uh, or I should say less than half the touches in this game. So it was really hard. Um, it seems like it was really hard to, uh, you know, really Im- implant himself on the game and um, be as much of a, uh, you know, quarterback, I guess, in this game and, and, and kind of lead Leipzig uh, in possession. So I thought that was interesting. And then, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think going into it a little bit more, going away from that, um, you know, Leverkusen is a good team. Um, so I think getting this, this draw in the day was not, you know, the worst thing for Leipzig. Um, I know they did have some chances to kind of, uh, you know, go ahead or at least, uh, score a second goal in this game. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, especially with Dortmund losing Pat and Byron losing on the, on the same weekend, um, you know, a draw to Leverkusen actually doesn't look that bad for them. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Point's a point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like you mentioned too, it, it's interesting that the stat you brought up too. I want to go back where you know that's less than half, um, right? In terms yeah. of the so that that's kind of intriguing and, and um, just slightly concerning. Again, not the end of the world, just one game. But um, you certainly want him on the ball more and, and kind of uh, you know, moving and, and kind of kickstarting the the attack and the transitions there. So. Again, just uh, something to certainly keep your eye on in terms of uh, Adams. But again, that's that's a player that I know you and I are both not worried about in terms of his his characteristics, his, his leadership, and you know all the other qualities he possesses. Um, I I know he's still fairly uh, new in in uh, I guess you could say the you know the European uh, you know leagues and in the Bundesliga. But he he almost comes off as a uh, you know six seven year veteran. Um, you know, just the way that, you know, he speaks in interviews and, and uh, you know, directing play and, and you know, watching kind of, obviously you can't see, hear him, but, you know, pointing at players and kind of motioning, being vocal. So um, I, I'm not too worried. Um, and again, like, like I you know, started at the beginning there, um, you know, some, you know, you, you have your, your off moments there. And again, to, to salvage a draw, even previously, like, uh, you know, Juventus did where, um, you know, a point to point. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very true. Yeah. And it's funny you say six or seven year vet, I guess Tyler Adams, if he made his debut at 16, I, I believe. So he's, he's actually right around that. that oh, wow. Time is flying. I guess uh, uh, I'm from kind of uh, twilight zone with uh, COVID going on. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy to be too. So 
Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of all I have from Tyler today. Um, I think, you know, continuing to start is great because Conrad Lamer is still out and it really looks like Julian Nagelsmann, Nagelsmann is, is going to Tyler for those starting minutes in midfield. So I'm very happy. I think, you know, even though it wasn't his best game, just seeing him on the field for 90 minutes is, um, you know, good for right now. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, pass it over to you, Pat, now for, I would say the most exciting news of the week. Yeah. So now we're, we're getting into the good stuff here. Um, you know, better positive news and uh, Serginho Dest, you know, looks like uh, it's reported. Um, he's decidingly joining uh, Barcelona. Hopefully by the time this comes out. Yeah. Be- hopefully by the time this comes yeah. out. Yeah. We'll, we'll kind of keep you guys updated, um, you know, Instagram and Twitter and all that too. Um, you know, if, if we can't get out before, uh, you know, posting here on YouTube, but, um, again, it appears he told his teammates, um, you know, the previous match there that he signed for Barca, kind of saying his goodbyes. And yeah, I mean, it looks like there's still details that need to be worked out, Austin, but pending a 22, 23 million, um, you know, move plus add ons. So it looks like they're pretty confident, like you said, in, in completing the deal there. And yeah, I mean, I know we were both talking about um, preferring Bayern. Um, so it's interesting, obviously it's, it's a move that he's, he's wanted and has expressed in the past. So, um, yeah, yeah. I want to get your thoughts on it. Yeah. I think, you know, either team he chose, you know, Byron or Barca was definitely, you know, a good choice in my opinion, you know, you could definitely, um, you know, think of each situation and him, I guess, not getting the starting role right from the start. You know, when you look at each club, you got, Benjamin Pavard and even, you know, Joshua Kimmich um, at, at Bayern Munich who play that right back position. And then you go to uh, Barcelona who still have Sergio Roberto who actually started this weekend at, at right back. So I think either team he went to, he wasn't going to be the, the number one right back uh, from day one. So I think with that being said, you know, it, it really kind of um, eliminates the tears in my opinion, obviously Barca have a, uh, you know, the whole messy situation going on and, um, you know, their president's kind of uh, hated right now in, in, in the capital. Um, but I still think that, you know, uh, that's a great destination to go. Um, so, you know, Serginho, it seems like, is a, a big Barcelona fan. So, you know, hopefully if he goes to a team like that, he's going to be motivated even more to get better and better. And, um, you know, really could be um, a storybook you know, story for him. So, uh, yeah, I, I, at the end of the day, I thought both teams were, were great. So I'm happy to see him go to Barca. Yeah. Yeah. Even the kind of, I guess, troubles that they're going through right now, it's still a historic club and fantastic move, um, for Destin and just all of, uh, American soccer. So just, just being in training and again, pushing for that spot, not kind of instantly coming in and having it, um, you know, certainly will, you know, make him work harder as a player and and really kind of up his level. And I think we're going to just see him further progress, especially, uh, you know, working on the defensive side, as well as just, you know, even adding extra elements to his game moving forward, which will, you know, certainly benefit our country. So, yeah, just wanted to kind of bring up that exciting news there quickly. And and hopefully we'll be hearing about that finalized soon um, because it looks like he'd be uh, joining uh, and kind of meeting back up, uh, reunited with uh, our, our boy Conrad. Right. Yeah. So, so how do you think um, he'll really fit into Barca? Do you see him, um, you know, starting at right back um, over Sergio Roberto, um, you know, in the future, I think, you know, as the season goes on, or do you think um, he'll kind of be that, that backup for the the whole season? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would almost say, um, maybe, maybe at least half of the season, uh, he's kind of under that backup, but and maybe it's just my opinion and, and what I you know know a little bit of knowledge about uh, you know Sergi there, but uh, he he seems more um, you know not a, not a player that's kind of cemented and locked in either, and kind of uh, you know can can move around there and and uh, you know has kind of come you know in and out of sides too uh, in the past, where I think you know as opposed to uh, the Bayern situation, I think it would be you, know, you could argue maybe that'd be a little bit harder to break in, so. I wouldn't be surprised, Austin, if uh, you know by the end of the year we see Dest, um, maybe not the full fledged you know starter, but you know at least kind of splitting time there. 
Okay. And how do you think he's going to fit into, you know, the Barcelona way right now is kind of hard to uh, really nail down and, and kind of understand at the moment. But do you think, you know, uh, the players he's surrounded with, you know, you're talking about Lionel Messi, uh, it looks like Philippe Coutinho is now a starter for Barca. Yeah. Uh, with Anton Griezmann and uh, definitely Ansu Fadi. Do you think he's uh, going to fit in better um, at Barca in that, you know, with those players in the starting lineup, um, as opposed to, I guess, when you looked at Bayern. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, yeah, I think it. I think he will fit in. Um, you know, great in terms of you know what we've seen from him and and kind of that Barcelona style, th- those quick passes and, and movements in the space, and uh, you can already see some of that from him, and that'll just develop further. So playing alongside some of those greats, I could see some awesome overlap, <laughs> beautiful crosses to to Messi and Fadi and company and even, uh, you know, linking with Coutinho, I think are all those technical players, which Sergino Des certainly is. So again, I still think he would have yeah. done fairly well at Bayern, but I almost would say that, you know, in terms of La Liga style and, and just the technical side of things, especially Barcelona, that I think this would be great for his development. What about, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think, um, yeah, I think it, it'll be really fun to see him play, um, you know, and I, Ajax is a very skilled team too, but I think right. in that environment where everyone is good with the ball at their feet, um, yeah, I think that's where he's going to excel. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy he's going to a team like this. I, I know early on before he became kind of the undisputed starter last year, there was some, some rumors, I think of like Brighton early on before we really, oh yeah, <laughs> these big teams and some other teams like that level, um, in the Premier League. And in my opinion, I think that would have been horrible move for him just because uh you know he really wouldn't be able to attack with the ball at his feet or um you know use that that dynamic ability he has with the ball at his feet uh going forward for those teams so i think yeah just being in an environment like that will be uh will be interesting so yeah you have anything else to add no i think that was uh fantastic so again um, right. it'll be completed soon austin yeah, yeah. And like we said, hopefully by the time this comes out, um, you know, it's been, what is it? Uh, here we go, confirmed by Fabrizio uh, Romano. So, That's right. you know, it's got to be a done deal. <laughs> yeah, with that being said, we're going to move on to our final player today, and that would be Josh Sargent. So Josh actually pay, played 87 minutes for Werder Bremen um, in their uh, 3-1 win over Schalke. Schalke, Pat, lowly Schalke. Uh, unfortunate. Yeah. Oh my goodness. We'll get to that in a second here. But, uh, uh, you know, early on um, in the game, uh, Josh actually contributed to, to uh, Bremen's first goal. And it came off of, I guess what you'd call Pat, a headed assist um, off a corner um, to Nicholas Fulkrug, who, uh, you know, finished the ball into the back of the net to give to give Bremen the one nil lead. So, um, yeah, all, all around uh, pretty good game from Josh. He was very active throughout this game. Um, actually had another chance to, to score and put a, put a header on target. Um, I think it was in the second half and it was, you know, a nice ball he went up for and just headed right down into Ralph Farman, um, you know, at close range, great reaction save from him. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was overall, I think a good game from him. Um, definitely a, a better game than last week's game where we basically saw him play as a left midfielder. And oh it, yeah, that was a disaster. Yeah, it was. Oh my God, that was. Yeah, that was one of the worst Bremen games I've I've seen, and I've seen a lot of bad Bremen games. Uh, but uh, yeah, during the week, Florian Kofeld, uh, Josh's manager, actually took ownership of Josh, you know, in that position, and and I guess tasking him with track tracking back so much. So that was interesting to see. Florian Kofeld's a very uh, a man with a big ego, so it was interesting to see him. Uh, you know, say he made a mistake and uh, take ownership of it. So, uh, you know, that that was definitely cool uh, going into this game. And it, it looks like, you know, he helped the team, um, you know, in his normal position as, as a striker and, um, you know, help them win the game. Right. Alka, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, again. That <laughs> was, a little uh, asterisk. I, you know, I, I heard, again, I wasn't able to catch it live, but uh, just from uh, yourself and, and just even seeing it on Twitter more so where, it, you know, apparently is a pretty brutal game, I guess, throughout. Um, yeah, it wasn't the best game, but still. But, but still, yeah, again, fantastic for, for Josh to, to make an impact there. And he, he certainly got up there for the headers to, for that assist. So 
Um, Ronaldo you know, esque. Yeah, Ronaldo esque, you could say. So, again, some of those qualities, especially like I mentioned last time, and um, just the little things he does to pick up assists and, and make those runs. And again, now he's kind of, especially this game, was able to, to really thrive and, 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 and kind of, you know, obviously not, not in that uh, midfield type role. So, um, you know, he certainly just has all these great elements to his game where, uh, again, if, if we, you know, hopefully we can see some more, some more goal production. Um, right. I think there's no reason, you know, especially with the, the striker pool, obviously now you have Johansson and uh, um, <laughs> after coming through, but that striker pool is very limited where Sargent just, you know, has a string of games where he's, he has a few goals. He, he's right there for, for um, you know, the starter. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Johansson too, because Johansson was a former former Bremen player. So yeah, uh, brief stint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when he was when he was healthy, uh, he was on the field. So yeah, I, I think um, you know what I was alluding to earlier about Schalke. So I think we should mention too, since you know we have several players still at Schalke. Schalke that, America still. Right, right, and I guess Weston's still technically a Schalke player. <laughs> Knock on wood that you know he doesn't never. <laughs> Uh, but they actually just fired David Wagner, their coach. So um, if I'm not mistaken, they haven't won a game since before the restart uh, from COVID. So they were really in a bad, you know, patch of games. And and before, um, I guess before this new season started, they had a lot of injuries. So you could definitely attribute some of those losses to that. But they really looked horrible in this game. And, and they were horrible in their first game, losing 8-0 to Bayern. So, um yeah, yeah, you know, David Wagner, definitely, uh, I guess you would say an American coach and and someone that we were, you know, when, when he first got to that that team, excited to see and, and kind of hear about, you know, um, you know, his involvement uh, with the U.S. and, and how that was going to take shape at Schalke. Right. Uh, yeah, it just never really worked out. You know, he had some good moments early on last season, and then um, it just – they hit a wall um, in the winter right after winter began, winter session began uh, last season. And yeah, it was almost like at the end of this period with Schalke, he kind of lost interest with the team. You know, there were some reports that he was, he had a falling out with their technical director there. Um, so yeah, it just was a bad, bad situation. And um, you know, Schalke are not in a great spot right now. So yeah, it's strange to see a team that was uh, making a run in the Champions League not so long ago um, to see kind of where they've they've fallen. But uh, again, yeah, exactly. um, would you say? I guess quickly wanted to ask. Uh, I, I know Bremen, you know, obviously has been, you know, I guess keeping their their head above water. Um, but <laughs> would you say they're um, obviously it's so early, a small sample size, but. Could you see them, you know, finishing and kind of improving on the past season, and, and they're in kind of a, a slightly better spot? Uh, you're saying Bremen, not Schalke. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think I still think they've got a lot of problems. Um, you know, I I think we'll we'll see that this season. I don't think it's going to be fun to watch Bremen. Um, you know, unless they really turn things around and play similar to the way they did at the end of last season, they kind of got it together for a few games, but I just think their makeup doesn't make sense to me. You know, Florian Kofelt's trying to play a system that has, um, you know, it suits more wide midfielders than strikers. He, he's literally, and I've said this before, he's got like five or six strikers on his team and he tries to play them on the wing and it just doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, I, I think that's an issue. Um, it, I think right now they'll avoid relegation, um, but that's, you know, that's with Schalke not, uh, you know, turning this this thing around. I think right now Schalke is pretty much bottom of the Bundesliga in terms of skill uh, with maybe Armenia Bielefeld, who just got promoted from the two Bundesliga. Uh, that's rough. But, yeah, I mean, Bremen's definitely in that, like, 15 and below category um, in the Bundesliga, in my opinion. So... Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to get much better for Josh. But uh, you know, hopefully, you can, you know, score some goals and get out of the the ruins. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, just just play his way maybe into a again like we talked about mid level or just a a, a more uh, I guess Something. yeah stable environment. Um, you know, somewhere where he can kind of thrive and not be asked to you know play out of position or uh, you know tactics that just aren't fitting the team. Yeah. 
Very true. So I think that's that's everything, Pat, for today. So now let's head over to Quick Kicks. All right, all you yeah viewers, I think you know what time it is. It's the usual time, Austin and I, uh, our favorite time, and I hope it's yours as well. It's none other than Quick Kicks. Let's see you could test Dwayne Miller. It's Altador over the wall. All right, guys, and the first player we're going to talk about in quick kicks is Zach Steffen over at Man City with his uh, first start and a 2-1 win in the Carabao Cup over Bournemouth. That's right. It was good to see him get on the field and, uh, yeah, get his first cap under his belt. And then we uh, have Haji Wright. So Haji Wright subbed on, played 27 minutes, and scored two goals for his team, um, lifting them to a 3-1 win. So good to see Haji, uh, you know, finding his form again. Yeah, top of the uh, scores table there, Austin, in the league. So that's, that's right. Great. Yeah. Great. And uh, heading over to uh, Portugal, we have uh, Reggie Cannon, uh, with Boa Vista there. Unfortunately, um, they had a, a brutal 5 nothing loss to Porto, but he started and played the full 90. So nonetheless, nice to see him get minutes. Yeah, that was kind of brutal. Um, but yeah, good to see him get on the field. And then we have Brian Keo and Michael Edwards. So both started... Uh, with Ko playing 69 minutes and Edwards playing 90 minutes in Wolfsburg 2's uh, 1-0 win. So good to see both of them continuing to get minutes in the Wolfsburg uh, Youth Academy. Absolutely, the Wolfsburg boys. And uh, we Wolfgang. have uh, Wolfgang. <laughs> and we have uh, Indiana Vasilev, Austin, over in League One in, in England there. Um, so unfortunately, Burton Albion lost 4-2 to win in town, but Vasilev did uh, play the last uh, 24 minutes, I believe. And I had some uh, touches and, and had an impact there, some some duels won. So nice to see him get minutes. True. And going back to Germany, we have Malik Sonogo. So Malik didn't score a hat-trick this weekend. He actually scored one goal um, in uh, Union Berlin's U-17s through one win. So good to see him continue to get on, this, on the score sheet. Wish it was a hat-trick, but hey, we'll take a goal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, heading over to, to France uh, with uh, Nick Giacchini there started and played uh, the full 90 again uh, for Khan. Unfortunately, they did lose one uh, nil, but again, nice to see him get the minutes. Yeah, and going to Austria, we have Eric Palmer-Brown, who started and played 90 minutes in Austria Vines 2-2 draw. So good for Eric. And uh, Emmanuel Sabi uh, started and played 84 minutes. And unfortunately, a uh, 4-2 loss there for uh, Odense there. Um, against uh, Argus. So, again, I was actually able to check out that game. Sabi looked pretty bright, but, uh, um, you know, hopefully we'll see more goals or assists next time. Yeah, and uh, going to Belgium, we have Chris Durkin, who starred and played 84 minutes, although it was in St. Truden's 2-0 loss. And uh, heading back to uh, England's League One there with Marlon Fossey, actually, uh, you know, played, uh, you know, Started the match full 90 in a 1 1 draw there. Um, you know, Plymouth or Shrewsbury, and, and again was, you know, apparently rated man of the match. So great for Marlon. And going uh, back to Germany, we have our boy Evan Rotundo, who started and played 90 minutes for Schalke's U 17s uh, in their 1 1 draw. So uh, yeah, good to see him back on the pitch. And uh, yeah. Nice. And it uh, looks like last but not least here, Austin, but uh, Kyle Avre uh, for Lille's U uh, 17s. Uh, started the match and actually had a goal and two assists there and an 8 1 win. So that's a, you know, a solid win um, and you know, great stat line there for Kyle. So that's it for our episode today, guys. Make sure you like this video and subscribe down below. And as always, don't forget to check out Instagram, Twitter. Um, you know, there's a lot of Americans making uh, headways there. So you don't want to miss out on that, uh, those immediate updates there. That's very true, Pat. And also check out uh, our episode in podcast form um, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Um, so make sure you, you you know subscribe on those platforms and leave us a review. That's right. And uh, again, Austin, not the uh, you know greatest week for some of our Americans, but uh, you know nonetheless, uh, you know I think they all have the ability to kind of put their head down, work hard in training, and and kind of you know finish strong next week. Yeah, definitely not the strongest week, but we had such a you know strong weekend uh, the week before. So I guess we can't complain too much. But uh, yeah, you know there is going to be some setbacks along the way, Pat. But that's all leading to one day.
our team winning the World Cup.